I'm going to talk briefly about an approach to the pink uh, pulseless hand after supercondylars, something that we all dread. Just to, so this is a five-year-old comes in with, uh, um, was referred after close reduction percutaneous fixation. You can see actually it disappeared on here, but there's a pin right here. Uh, he came in the ER, he had pink, his hand was pulseless. This was his original film. If you look at his fingers, they said he was pink and pulseless, but this is rubor. He had an anterior osseous nerve palsy and no compartment syndrome. He had absent FPL, weak FDP, no pain on past extensions or didn't have a compartment syndrome. What would you do? And so we'll come back, observe him, do an arteriogram, surgical exploration, fasciotomy. Would you consult or transfer? And, and I, I would submit to you right now in the United States, th there is no weakness at all in a patient who doesn't have a fulminant, full-blown, multi-hour compartment syndrome, transferring them anytime, anywhere, and no one should actually ever criticize you for doing that. So what do we know? The Garland uh, type three and four fractures, there's very mixed guidelines for what you should do without a compartment syndrome. Compartment syndrome is easy, and the median nerve is confounding and make it more difficult and transfer as appropriate. If you look at the literature, it's about 6% will be pink pulseless, except in Greece, for some reason, they had 51% in Thessalonica. Uh, so this can occur, and it can be significant. The classification that exists is pink and warm and white and cold, but I'll show you some uh, data, and I was asked to create an algorithm that it's a little more complicated than that. Uh, you have all these modifiers of poor refill, Turger, Rubor, Doppler signals, if they're monophasic, uh, you can measure DBIs, and anyone can do that. It's quite easy. High energy, open, compartments compromised, if there's a nerve injury and posterior lateral displacement. You ought to take all of these things into account and not just group one versus group two. Group one is obviously urgent. Group two is emergent. Uh, compartment syndrome is agreement, fasciotomy. There is a little bit of debate about looking at the brachial artery or not. Um, I would submit to you that that's a very easy thing to do. And then obviously reduction internal fixation. There's a multicenter study that showed that the pulseless hand with the median nerve is not an absolute indication, but it's a risk factor, a factor for surgical exploration. We know that exploration of the brachial artery and, and, fa and a fasciotomy are bundled. They just pay you the same for doing both, and they're bundled for a good reason. If you explore the brachial artery, you ought to do a fasciotomy. The Volkman's contracture is a disaster, and some patients need open procedures. And because many or most do well is not a reason not to operate on the ones that need it. We also know that a Doppler evaluation is valuable and is easy to do. Uh, there is no evidence that you need to do arteriograms. Uh, if you need something extra, you can do it in the operating room, and that's a that's pretty well recognized as a waste of time. And we know that a patent brachial artery is better than an occluded or transected brachial artery. So I'm in the Pediatric Orthopedic Society and the Hand Society, and I can tell you that this bias, because you don't know, you're afraid of a nerve and vessel, is not a reason not to do something. We know that you can determine arterial insufficiency and whether we think pink and pulseless is good or not. If your DBI is less than 0.7, that's not good, and if it's less than 0.5, that's really bad. And an absent pulse with poor capillary refill that's cool, that has poor turgor and rubor is, is bad, and it doesn't matter whether you want to have one or two categories if you need some extra information. You can ligate the brachial artery. This has been done in, in uh, 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 cardiac casts. But this is, I would submit, is not really able to be appropriately extrapolated. These are small incisions, there's no trauma, the brachialis isn't torn, the, the bone didn't displace out, almost tearing the skin, so it's different. But we do know, even with that, in the best circumstances, there's a decreased pulse pressure, there's loss of endurance, and there's minimal to no shortening in the function, but the function is still pretty good. We know that after reduction in stabilization, Perfusion can be improved, but you can lose a pulse, okay? Uh, you don't usually lose it after 36 or 48 hours, but a pulse can come back and go away, or it can come back and look better, uh, and that collaterals may provide adequate uh, perfusion in the absence of compartment syndrome, or you can have them and get a compartment syndrome anyway. Now, the problem is that there's a huge bias in the literature based on training. Classic pediatric orthopedic says they're much less likely to explore it, Hand microsurgery trained surgeons are more likely. Obviously, neither one of these is optimal. 
neurologic exam, careful motor exam, um, which is missed most frequently that I see, is people fail to recognize that they have an anterior osseous nerve palsy. We want to check sensibility and pulse and perfusion, and the quality of that pulse and perfusion is really important. Remember, rubor is bad, red is not good, light pink is good, and too much turgor is bad too. So here's what I would look at. You have a group one, pink and warm, a, a, and I look at the Doppler. This is what you can do first. If it's triphasic and biphasic and we don't have risk factors, which I'll show you, that's one that you really ought to just reduce and then check, recheck them, and I'll come back to that. If it's open or it's a monophasic closed with no signal and your DVI is less than 0.5, you ought to consider opening those and looking at them, and obviously the white cold you ought to operate. These are the modifiers, high energy hematoma, nerve injury, open fracture, tin skin, tin skin tenting. I really worry about that. I see these patients where the bone is torn through the brachialis and is sitting under the skin. Posterior lateral displacement, you know that nerve and artery may be tethered by that. And so this is a concern. So it's easy, the pink pulseless, group A, the, uh, 1A, that's, these are the good ones, triphasic, uh, biphasic pulses, pink, no, cap, no compartment syndrome, closed reduction, percutaneous fixation, reassess them. And you may need to open them, but most of the time these will do quite well. That group 1A, that's the pink perfused, but has um, no real, uh, uh, it's monophasic, not biphasic. DBI is gonna be less than 0.7 and the open fractures, one, two, whatever they are, you ought to really consider doing an open reduction. You can do this very simply. Um, through a transverse incision and you can sweep the vessels and nerve away from the fracture and often they're impaled on it. Uh, and then if you want to, you can do a formal vascular exploration and reconstruction unless the pulse returns. And, you, and if you do that, you can do a percutaneous uh, fasciotomy. I would recommend that. And it's all of these transfer is very reasonable. Now the group two, the white cold initial care reduction, it's okay to do that with rigid fixation and reassess. I prefer to actually make a little incision, look at these. What you find is, is that the uh, majority of, very few, you know, less than 5% are transected. About 20% actually have thrombosis in the artery most uh, that's extensive. And then the, the vast majority have these intraluminal hemorrhages where the, a collateral has been torn off, that's what you're seeing here, and that you do an arteriolysis and fasciotomy, they'll do quite well with that. So pink pulseless, obviously 1A, 2, 3 with modifiers. Consider on all of these, if you're concerned uh, to do an open reduction and look at the vessels. So let's go back to our five-year-old. Remember he came in, he was pink and pulseless, now you can see the pin from, so we looked at him in the ER. Uh, he uh, had the rubor we talked about. His DBI was 0.4. He didn't have a compartment syndrome. We didn't do an arteriogram. We did a surgical exploration. Here are his vessels. We did a transverse incision. You can make a little slight hockey stick here. If you need to do a fasciotomy and there's, it's not a compartment syndrome, you can do it percutaneously or you can make a little oblique incision here and that makes the scar quite nicely. This was an intramural thrombosis uh, where a branch had been evulsed. We did an arteriolysis and he uh, neuralized the median nerve which had a contusion in it. Uh, did a fasciotomy, and this patient did really well. We gave him a very brief two days of anticoagulation. Patency restored, radial pulse was uh, full in the recovery room. So I'll just stop there. This is, in summary, is a complicated issue. There's potential for disaster. Without a microvascular capability, referral is often prudent, and this is never a dump. We get lots of patients, they call the vascular surgeon, and they say send it to orthopedics. Uh, the quality of the Doppler signal I would submit to you is absolutely the easiest thing in the world to do and it, it will guide your treatment. An open reduction internal fixation or open reduction percutaneous fixation with nerve vascular exploration is quite reasonable. Don't send them home that night. Keep them 36 to 48 hours, whatever the insurance company tells you. Thank you.